Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of the Joe Rogan Experience. Today, we have a very special guest. He's a warrior, a leader, and a survivor in the harsh world of the post-apocalyptic Mojave wasteland. Please give a warm welcome to Caesar, the leader of Caesar's Legion. Thank you, Joe. It's an honor to be here. So, Caesar, there's been a lot of talk about the upcoming Second Battle of Hoover Dam. Can you tell us more about it? Yes. The Second Battle of Hoover Dam will be a defining moment in the history of the Mojave Wasteland. It will determine the fate of our great nation and decide who will rule over it. The NCR, the New California Republic, and my legion have been at odds for a long time, and this battle will be the culmination of that conflict. It sounds intense. Uh, what do you think the outcome will be? I have faith that my legion will emerge victorious. We have been preparing for this battle for a long time, and our warriors are ready to fight and die for the glory of the legion. The NCR may have more soldiers, but they lack the discipline and the strength of my legion. But what about the people of the Mojave? What will happen to them after the battle? The people of the Mojave will become part of the legion. They will be assimilated into our culture and they will benefit from our rule. We will bring order and stability to the region and we will create a new civilization based on strength, discipline, and honor. It's definitely a different kind of society than what we're used to, but I can see the appeal of order and stability in a world like yours. Now, Caesar, there have been rumors about a legendary figure known as the Burned Man. Can you tell us more about him? I don't know what you're talking about, Joe. Come on, Caesar. I've heard stories about the Burned Man being your top general and a key player in your Legion's victories. Is there any truth to these rumors? The Burned Man is a figure of legend, a myth that my soldiers tell each other to inspire them. But he is not a real person. There is no such thing as the Burned Man. Okay, I see. But if he did exist, what would make him such a formidable warrior? If the Burned Man were real, he would be a man of great strength and courage, a warrior without fear or remorse. He would have been burned alive, a punishment for his failures, but he survived and rose from the ashes, stronger and more determined than ever before. That's quite a story. Do you think the Burn Man will play a role in the Second Battle of Hoover Dam? I cannot say for certain. The Burn Man is a myth, Joe. He is not real. But if he were, I suppose he could be a powerful asset in battle. I understand. Well, whether the Burn Man is real or not, your legion seems to be a force to be reckoned with. What do you see as the future of the Mojave Wasteland under your rule? The future is bright, Joe. With the NCR defeated, we will bring order and stability to the region. We will create a new civilization based on the principles of strength, discipline, and honor. And who knows, perhaps one day, the Burn Man will be a part of that future as well. That's an ambitious vision, Caesar. And speaking of your legion, I wanted to ask you about your legate, Lanius. He's been described as a brutal and ruthless warrior, even by your own standards. What do you think of him? Lanius is a force to be reckoned with, Joe. He is a symbol of the legion's strength and power. He has led my armies to victory on many occasions, and he has instilled fear into our enemies. Lanius is a true warrior, one who embodies the virtues of our legion. I can see why he's so respected among your soldiers. But what about his reputation for being merciless and bloodthirsty? Do you think that's a fair characterization? Lanius is a warrior, Joe. He fights for the Legion, and he will do whatever it takes to achieve victory. He is not interested in mercy or kindness, but he is not mindless or cruel either. He understands the importance of discipline and strategy. Lanius is a valuable asset to the Legion, and I trust him to lead our forces in the Second Battle of Hoover Dam. It's clear that Lanius is a key figure in your legion's hierarchy. But what about your own role in the battle? Will you be leading your troops into battle, or will you be overseeing the strategy from afar? I will be on the front lines, Joe. I am a warrior at heart, and I will fight alongside my soldiers in the battle for the Mojave. The second battle of Hoover Dam will be a test of strength and will, and I will not let my legion down. That's quite a commitment, Caesar. You're putting yourself in harm's way to achieve victory. Now, I want to ask you something, Caesar. What do you think about Mr. House and what he's done so far? I have an itch that one courier who was shot in Good Springs had something to do with him. House is a clever man, Joe. He has survived in the Mojave Wasteland for longer than most, and he has amassed a great deal of power and wealth. But his obsession with technology and his isolationism are weaknesses. He cannot see the bigger picture. 
the need for a united and disciplined society. And as for the courier, well, I cannot say for certain, but it's clear that House had enemies, and it's possible that the courier was one of them. I've heard some wild stories about House and his plans for New Vegas. What do you think his ultimate goal is? House's ultimate goal is power, Joe. He wants to control the Mojave and its resources, to be the ruler of an independent city-state. But he underestimates the importance of ideology and culture. Without a strong foundation, his rule will be weak and short-lived. The Legion, on the other hand, has a clear vision and a strong ideology. We will create a new civilization based on the principles of order and discipline, one that will last for generations. That's quite a pitch, Caesar. But I can see that you believe in your cause. It'll be interesting to see how it all plays out. You've spoken a lot about your own legion in Mr. House, but what do you think about the new California Republic and their president, Kimball? The NCR is a corrupt and bloated bureaucracy, Joe. They claim to stand for democracy and freedom, but in reality they are just a collection of greedy politicians and self-serving bureaucrats. Kimball is a weak leader who is unable to control his own government, let alone the Mojave. The NCR has no vision, no discipline, and no strength. They are a crumbling empire, and their defeat is inevitable. That's a strong stance, Caesar. But do you think there's any hope for a peaceful resolution between your legion and the NCR? Or is war the only answer? War is always the last resort, Joe. But the NCR has proven time and time again that they cannot be trusted to keep their word. They have broken treaties and agreements and they continue to expand their territory into our lands. The Legion is not a peaceful organization, but we are willing to negotiate and make deals. However, the NCR must first recognize our strength and our legitimacy. I can understand that perspective. It's clear that there's a lot of tension and animosity between your two factions. But who do you think has the upper hand in the conflict right now? The Legion or the NCR? The Legion, of course. We are a disciplined and well-trained army, and we have already won many battles against the NCR. They are a disorganized and poorly led force, and their soldiers lack the courage and the conviction to face us in battle. The Second Battle of Hoover Dam will be a turning point in the conflict, Joe. The Legion will emerge victorious, and the NCR will crumble beneath our feet. Well, it sounds like you're confident in your abilities, Caesar. I wish you luck in the upcoming battle. Thanks again for joining me today. Thank you, Joe. It was a pleasure to be here. I'm Joe Rogan, and I'm here in the Mojave Wasteland, where the sun is scorching and the sand is blowing. Now, I know you're all out there surviving in this harsh and unforgiving environment, and that's why I want to tell you about a product that can help you stay healthy and strong. Introducing the Mojave Survival Kit. This kit comes with everything you need to survive in the wasteland, including a water filtration system, a durable backpack, a first aid kit, and more. With the Mojave Survival Kit, you can hike through the desert without worrying about dehydration, build a shelter to protect yourself from the elements, and even defend yourself from raiders and creatures with the included survival knife. So don't wait any longer. Order your Mojave Survival Kit from your local caravan or outpost today, and make sure you have the tools you need to survive in this harsh and unforgiving world. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Joe Rogan Experience. Today, we have a very special guest joining us all the way from Utah. He's known as the Malpays Legate, but his real name is Joshua Graham. Joshua, thanks for joining us. It's my pleasure to be here, Joe. Thank you for having me. Joshua, you have a fascinating story. You were a member of Caesar's Legion, an army that's known for its brutality. But then something happened, and you left the Legion and became a sort of a hero among the people of New Canaan. Can you tell us about that? Yes, Joe. I was a high-ranking member of the Legion, but after my failed attack on Hoover Dam, I was burned alive and thrown down the Grand Canyon, left for dead. But I survived, and I made it to New Canaan. They helped me find a new purpose in life and gave me a chance to redeem myself. That's amazing, yet sad. You were the Malpai's legate, a respected leader, and then became yet another respected man in New Canaan. What's it like to be a leader in such a dangerous world? And how's New Canaan doing? It's a heavy burden, Joe. But it's also an honor to be able to help people and make a difference. I try to lead by example and show people that there's always hope, even in the darkest of times. 
Unfortunately, the White Legs have recently destroyed New Canaan. I advise any traders who hear this message to steer clear of the town. That means you, Alice McLafferty. That's unfortunate, but you deliver a great message, Joshua. And speaking of the White Legs, what do you think of Caesar? I have nothing but contempt for Caesar. He's a bastard who preaches about strength and honor. But in reality, he's a cruel and manipulative dictator who cares only for his own power. He's responsible for countless atrocities, and he's brought nothing but pain and suffering to the people of the Mojave. Not only that, but he actively perpetuates slavery with his slave boys. Slave boys? Sorry, I meant slave girls. Hmm. <laughs> Those are some strong words. Have you ever met Caesar face to face? Yes, I have. And let me tell you, he's not the impressive figure that he makes himself out to be. He's a small-minded man with a twisted sense of morality. I'm glad that I left his legion and found a better path. It sounds like you've been through a lot, Joshua. But you've also found a way to make a positive impact on the world. Do you have any advice for people who are struggling to find their own purpose? Yes, Joe. My advice would be to never give up hope and seek God. No matter how dark things may seem, there's always a way to turn things around. Find something that you're passionate about and throw yourself into it. God is but one path, and don't be afraid to ask for help when you need it. We're all God's children and can accomplish great things together. That's great advice, Joshua. Now, you mentioned earlier that you were a high-ranking member of Caesar's Legion. I'm sure our listeners are curious about one of the most notorious figures in the Legion, Legate Lenius. What can you tell us about him? Ah, yes, Legate Lanius. He's a brutal warrior who's feared and respected by many in the Legion. He's a master of hand-to-hand -hand combat and a skilled strategist. But he's also a man who's been consumed by his own rage and thirst for power. He's a dangerous foe to anyone who stands in his way. It sounds like he's not someone you want to mess with. No, he's not. Lanius is a force to be reckoned with. But I also know that he's not invincible. Every man has his weaknesses, and Lanius is no exception. If someone were to exploit those weaknesses, they might have a chance of defeating him. Let's turn things around a bit and talk about herbal medicine. I've tried some healing powder, and that shit is the bomb. What can you tell us about natural medicine? Natural medicine has been used for thousands of years to treat all kinds of ailments. The best part is that it doesn't rely on technology, which is ultimately good. There's also a certain psychedelic element to it, but I've only heard about it from recruit legionaries. Isn't drug use forbidden by the Legion? Yes, but to be honest, some of us don't give a shit. That's fascinating. What are some examples of natural remedies that you've used? Well, one of my favorites is yarrow. It's a plant that's been used for centuries to stop bleeding and promote healing. I've also used willow bark, which contains a natural form of aspirin, to relieve pain and reduce inflammation. And of course, there's healing powder, which is made from a combination of plants and minerals and has a wide range of uses. That's amazing. Have you ever done mushrooms? Ha 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 ha. No, Joe, I haven't. As a former member of Caesar's Legion, drug use was strictly forbidden. Plus, I've always been more focused on achieving a higher state of consciousness through spiritual and meditative practices. I hear you, but, you know, some people claim that psychedelic experiences can lead to... Profound spiritual insights. Yes, I've heard that as well. And I'm certainly not here to judge anyone's experiences. But for me personally, I prefer to rely on my own inner resources to achieve a higher state of consciousness. That's totally understandable. And it's great that you have found a path that works for you. Thanks for sharing your perspective, Joshua. You're welcome, Joe. It's been a pleasure. Are you tired of the same old casinos with their stuffy atmosphere and boring games? Then it's time to hit up the Atomic Wrangler, where the party never stops. At the Atomic Wrangler, we've got everything you need to have a good time. From our wide selection of hookers and slot machines and table games to our legendary live entertainment. And with our friendly whores, I mean staff, and our unbeatable prices, you won't find a better place to let loose and blow off some steam. But the Atomic Wrangler is more than just a casino. We're also... 
your one-stop shop for all your needs in Freeside. From our full-service bar to our top-of-the-line hotel rooms, we've got you covered. And with our convenient location right on the Strip, you'll be in the heart of the action in no time. So what are you waiting for? Come on down to the Atomic Wrangler and experience the thrill of gambling like never before. Remember, the Atomic Wrangler, where the fun never stops. Thanks to all you wonderful folks down at the Atomic Wrangler for sponsoring the Joe Rogan Experience, the new California Republic's number one podcast. And can someone please tell Destiny that I've sent her payment via the Mojave Express. One of their couriers picked it up and is on their way to deliver it to her right now. I think it was Courier 6. And will someone also tell Destiny to stop threatening me? She keeps saying she's going to tell my wife about what we did, and honestly, I really don't need that right now. Welcome back to the Joe Rogan Experience, where we explore a wide range of topics with fascinating guests from all walks of life. Today, we have a very special guest joining us from the Mojave Wasteland. He is the leader of New Vegas and a powerful figure in the post-apocalyptic world. Please welcome Mr. House. Thank you, Joe. It's a pleasure to be here. Mr. House, you have a very unique perspective on the world, given the fact that you've been around for over 200 years. Can you tell us a little bit about your background and how you've managed to survive all these years? Certainly, Joe. I was born in 2020, and I've always had a keen interest in science and technology. In the 21st century, I became one of the wealthiest people in the world through my innovations in computing and robotics. When the Great War broke out in 2077, I managed to survive by sealing myself in a high-tech underground bunker known as the Lucky 38. From there, I've been able to monitor the world and make strategic moves to protect and advance my interests. That's incredible. And now... You're the leader of New Vegas, a city that has managed to thrive in the midst of all this chaos. How have you been able to achieve that? Well, Joe, it's taken a lot of careful planning and hard work. I've invested heavily in technology and infrastructure, and I've established a strong system of law and order. It's amazing how you've been able to maintain power and stability in such a chaotic world. I'm sure our listeners have a lot of questions for you, Mr. House, so let's get started. One of the most fascinating things about your story, Mr. House, is how you managed to live for over 200 years. Can you tell us more about the technology that allowed you to survive? Of course, Joe. As I mentioned earlier, I was always interested in science and technology, and I had access to some of the most advanced equipment and knowledge of the time. When I realized that the Great War was imminent, I knew I had to take drastic measures to ensure my survival. So I poured all my resources into creating a self-sustaining underground facility known as the Lucky 38. That sounds like something straight out of a sci-fi movie. Can you tell us more about the Lucky 38 and what it was capable of? The Lucky 38 was designed to be a self-sustaining bunker that could provide me with all the resources I needed to survive indefinitely. It had its own power supply and air purification system. That's amazing. And what about your physical body? Did you undergo any procedures or enhancements to prolong your lifespan? Yes, Joe. I realized early on that my physical body would not last forever, so I made the decision to transfer my consciousness into a machine. I developed a sophisticated technology that allowed me to upload my mind into a network of computers. That's incredible. It's amazing how technology has allowed you to overcome the limitations of the human body and live for centuries. I can only imagine the possibilities this kind of technology could have for humanity in the future. Indeed, Joe. The potential for technological advancements is limitless. And as long as I'm alive, I will continue to use my knowledge and resources to advance the cause of science and technology. Let's talk more about your work in New Vegas, Mr. House. The city has become a beacon of hope in the post-apocalyptic wasteland. Can you tell us more about what you did to save the city and establish stability? Certainly, Joe. When I regained consciousness long after the bombs fell, I saw an opportunity to rebuild and create a new society. I knew that the Hoover Dam was a crucial source of power and water, so I made it my mission to secure the dam and establish a city around it, but the NCR got to it first. And how did you manage to establish order and stability in the city? Well, Joe, I knew that a successful society needed a strong foundation of law and order. I created the Securitron robots, which were designed to enforce my laws and protect the citizens of New Vegas. I also established the four families, 
who have helped maintain peace and stability in the city. It's amazing how you were able to establish such a functional society in the midst of all this chaos. What would you say has been your biggest challenge in running New Vegas? It's the biggest challenge, Joe, has been dealing with the various factions and groups that exist in the wasteland. I've had to navigate complex political relationships, especially with the NCR, and make tough decisions to maintain the stability of the city. But overall, I'm proud of what I've accomplished in New Vegas. It's truly impressive, Mr. House. You have managed to build a thriving society in a world that was once thought to be uninhabitable. I'm sure our listeners are inspired by your story and your vision for the future. Let's shift gears a bit and talk about the new California Republic, NCR. Mr. House, they're a powerful faction that's been vying for control of the Mojave Wasteland. What are your thoughts on the NCR and their goals? Well, Joe, the NCR is certainly a formidable force in the Wasteland. They've managed to establish a functioning government and maintain a level of stability in their territories. However, I disagree with their approach to governance and their reliance on outdated political systems. Can you elaborate on that? Of course. The NCR is a democratic republic, which means that they rely on the whims of the people to make decisions. This can lead to slow decision-making and a lack of long-term planning. I believe that a strong, visionary leader like myself is better equipped to make the tough decisions necessary for the survival and advancement of our society. That's a bold claim, Mr. House. Do you think that your approach is better suited to the challenges of the wasteland? Absolutely, Joe. The wasteland is a dangerous and unpredictable place, and it requires a leader who can make tough decisions quickly and efficiently. The NCR's democratic system is simply not equipped to handle the challenges we face. That's why I believe that New Vegas is the best hope for the future of humanity. I'm a busy man, so I'm afraid we may have to cut it short. That's okay. It's certainly a controversial viewpoint, Mr. House. I'm sure there are those who disagree with you. But there's no denying that your vision and your leadership have brought about significant changes to the Mojave Wasteland. Thanks for sharing your thoughts with us today. Thank you for having me, Joe. Attention all citizens of the New California Republic. Are you looking for a way to make a real difference in the world? To protect your homeland, your family, and your way of life? Then the NCR military is looking for you. As a member of the NCR military, you'll be part of the most powerful and respected military force in the wasteland. You'll receive the best training, equipment, and support to ensure that you're always at the top of your game. But being part of the NCR military is more than just a job. It's a calling. It's a chance to make a real difference in the world, to stand up for what's right and just, and to fight for a brighter future. So if you're ready to step up and be part of something bigger than yourself, if you're ready to serve your country with honor and distinction, then the NCR military is looking for you and list today and be part of the legacy of heroes who have defended the NCR for generations. Remember, the NCR military, defending our way of life, no matter the cost. A huge thanks to the wonderful folks at the NCR Propaganda, I mean Recruitment Office, for sponsoring the Joe Rogan Experience, the New California Republic's number one podcast. Hey, Jamie, can you cut that part where I almost thank the NCR's Propaganda Office? Wait, what do you mean we're still broadcasting live? Uh, it says, says... Ah, oh, fuck. This jet mixed with rad scorpion venom has got me hallucinating again. Jamie, help. Welcome back to the Joe Rogan Experience, folks. Today we have a special guest on the show, President Aaron Kimball, the leader of the new California Republic, currently occupying the Mojave Wasteland. Mr. President, it's an honor to have you here. Thank you, Joe. It's great to be here. So, uh, let's jump right into it. The new California Republic has a long and storied history. Can you tell us a little bit about the founding of your nation? Absolutely. Before the NCR, there existed Shady Sands. The town was rife with conflict, with constant problems from rad scorpions and raiders alike. That was until the vault dweller stepped in. He single-handedly saved the town, and we still praise him as a hero today. Afterward, the New California Republic was founded in 2186 by Aradesh, who is also our first president. Our primary goal is to create a stable democratic society that could thrive in the post-apocalyptic world. That's really interesting. The vault dweller is something that Marcus, another guest on our show, has mentioned. So how has the NCR changed over the years? Well, we've faced a lot of challenges over the years, but I like to think we've come out stronger on the other side. Our population has grown significantly, and we've expanded our borders to include much of California and parts of Nevada. 
One of our biggest challenges is dealing with the various factions and groups that exist in the Mojave Wasteland, where we're currently occupying. Those damn raider junkies, which we conveniently name fiends, have been giving us trouble left and right. Also, the cons have been a consistent problem for us. Some may call my take controversial, but Bitter Springs was justified. We've had to fight a number of battles to establish our presence here, and there are still threats that we need to deal with on a daily basis. That's a really bold take about Bitter Springs. Hmm. Speaking of the Mojave Wasteland, what can you tell us about the situation there? I've heard rumors of a conflict between the NCR and a group called the Legion. Yes, the Legion is a formidable enemy that we've been dealing with for some time now. They're a highly organized military force that's dedicated to the destruction of our republic. We've fought several battles with them already, but they continue to be a thorn in our side. That sounds like a tough fight. How do you plan to defeat the Legion? We have a number of strategies in place, but our primary focus is on winning the hearts and minds of the people of the Mojave. We believe that by demonstrating the benefits of democracy and freedom, we can show the people that the NCR is the best choice for their future. Well, it sounds like you have your work cut out for you. Another question, if you may. Many people have accused you of being corrupt and serving the will of the Brahmin barons. What do you say to these valid accusations? I'm sorry, Joel, but those accusations are completely baseless. The NCR is a democracy, and I serve the will of the people, not some wealthy elite. The Brahmin barons have no special influence over our government or our policies. Okay, but there have been reports of corruption within the NCR government, including allegations that some officials have accepted bribes from the Brahmin barons in exchange for favorable treatment. How do you respond to those claims? Those claims are simply untrue. We have a strict code of conduct within the NCR government, and anyone found to be engaging in corrupt activities will be punished to the fullest extent of the law. These allegations are nothing more than baseless rumors spread by our enemies. All right, fair enough. Let's move on to another topic. The NCR is often seen as a beacon of hope in the post-apocalyptic world, with its focus on democracy and freedom. But there are also those who criticize your government's expansionist policies. What do you say to those critics? Well... I would say that our expansionist policies are necessary for the survival of our republic. We need to secure new territories and resources in order to support our growing population and ensure our long-term stability. Of course, we always try to expand peacefully and through diplomatic means, but sometimes force is necessary to protect our interests. Uh, many people are curious about your relationship with Robert House, the founder of New Vegas. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, Mr. House is an interesting figure. He's a brilliant man with a lot of ideas about how to improve the Mojave wasteland. While we don't always see eye to eye on everything, we do share a common goal of making the region a better place for everyone. That's a diplomatic answer. But what do you really think of Mr. House and his plans for New Vegas? I suppose I should be careful what I say, since Mr. House is a powerful figure in the Mojave. But I will say this. While I respect his intelligence and his vision for the future, I have concerns about his methods. He's very secretive and seems to have his own agenda, which can be a bit unnerving. Now, some of our viewers may view you negatively, Mr. President, for your handling of certain crises in the past. For example, there was the I-15 incident where the new California Republic failed to provide aid to minors still troubled by death clause. There was also the situation at Camp Forlorn Hope, where NCR troops were left vulnerable to Legion attacks. And there have been concerns about your government's inability to deal with the Fiends gang. What do you have to say to those criticisms? Well, Joe, let me say that I take those criticisms very seriously. As the leader of the NCR, it is my responsibility to ensure the safety and security of our citizens and our troops. And in those instances, we fell short. However, it's important to understand that we are operating in a very challenging environment with limited resources and a multitude of threats. We are doing the best we can with what we have, but mistakes will inevitably happen. The important thing is that we learn from those mistakes and strive to do better in the future. I can understand that, but some people might argue that these mistakes are indicative of larger problems within the NCR government. They might say that you're stretched too thin or that you're not able to effectively govern such a large territory. What do you say to those criticisms? I say that those criticisms are unfounded. We have a robust system of governance in place, with checks and balances to ensure that power is not abused. And while there are certainly challenges associated with governing such a large territory, 
We have a dedicated and skilled workforce that is up to the task. Before we go, I have one more question for you, Mr. President. What are your thoughts on the Brotherhood of Steel? There have been reports of clashes between NCR troops and the Brotherhood in the past, and some people see them as a potential threat to the security of the region. The Brotherhood of Steel is an interesting group, to say the least. They have a unique perspective on the world and a strong sense of purpose. However, we have had our disagreements with them in the past, particularly over their hoarding of technology. That being said, we recognize that the Brotherhood can be a valuable ally in the fight against the Legion and other threats to the region. We are open to dialogue with them and are willing to work with them if it benefits the people of the Mojave. That's a reasonable approach. Well, Mr. President, thank you again for your time. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you, Joe. The pleasure was all mine. Let me tell you about our sponsor for today's show. Have you ever found yourself wandering the wasteland, parched and desperate for a drink? Well, worry no more because our sponsor has the solution. Introducing Sunset Sarsaparilla, the official beverage of the Mojave Wasteland. It's the perfect combination of sweetness and carbonation that will quench your thirst and give you the energy you need to keep trekking through this unforgiving landscape. Now, I know what you're thinking. Joe, is Sunset Sarsaparilla safe to drink? I don't want to end up with radiation poisoning. Well, let me tell you, Sunset Sarsaparilla has been thoroughly tested and is completely safe to consume. Definitely. In fact, it's so good, you'll forget you're even in a post-apocalyptic wasteland. Another question is, Joe, hasn't Sunset Sarsaparilla stopped production since the Great War? The answer is no. The NCR is actively building new manufacturing factories in the West, and those factories produce many products. One of those products is Sunset Sarsaparilla, which means it's in production again. So the next time you're out scavenging for supplies, be sure to grab a cold and refreshing bottle of Sunset Sarsaparilla. And don't forget to tune in to our show for more exciting adventures in the Mojave Wasteland. Welcome to the Joe Rogan Experience. Today, we have a very special guest, General Lee Oliver, Military General of the New California Republic. General, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me, Joe. It's an honor to be here. So, General Oliver, can you tell us a little bit about the New California Republic and your role in it? The New California Republic is a democratic federation that was formed from the ruins of the old world. Our goal and my quest are to restore order and rebuild civilization in the wasteland. I believe myself to be the effective leader of NCR military operations in the Mojave wasteland. That sounds like a pretty big responsibility. What kind of challenges do you face in the Mojave wasteland? Well, the Mojave wasteland is a hostile environment, to say the least. We have to deal with raiders, mutants, and other dangerous creatures on a daily basis. Plus, there are other factions in the area that don't exactly see eye to eye with us. Yeah, I can imagine that would be a tricky situation. How does the NCR deal with these other factions? We try to maintain a peaceful relationship with other factions whenever possible, but we're not afraid to use force if necessary. Our primary goal is to protect the citizens of the NCR and establish a stable government in the region. I see. So what kind of progress has the NCR made in the Mojave Wasteland? We've made significant progress in securing the region and establishing a stable government. We've brought law and order to areas that were once lawless, and we've helped to rebuild infrastructure that was destroyed during the war. That's impressive, but I'm sure there are still challenges ahead. What kind of future do you see for the NCR and the Mojave Wasteland? I see a bright future for both the NCR and the Mojave Wasteland. We have a lot of work to do, but I believe that we can create a thriving civilization in the wasteland. Of course, there will always be challenges, but I'm confident that we can overcome them and create a better future for everyone. General Oliver, I've heard some rumors about Camp Searchlight. Can you tell us more about it? Sure. Camp Searchlight is a former NCR military installation that was recently hit with a radioactive waste spill. It's now overrun with feral ghouls and other dangerous creatures. That sounds pretty intense. Have you ever been there? I have. And I can tell you that it's not a place for the faint of heart. Well, that's exactly why I may be interested in checking it out. Do you think it would be possible for me to accompany a group of NCR soldiers on a mission to Camp Searchlight? I'm afraid I can't authorize that, Joe. Camp Searchlight is too dangerous for civilians to be wandering around. It's strictly off limits to non-military personnel. I understand your concerns, General, but I think it would be a great opportunity for me to see firsthand the dangers that, that the NCR faces in the Mojave Wasteland. Can I at least hear your explanation of what happened? Okay, here goes. The short and simple story is that Legion spies infiltrated the base. 
To take us out, they scouted spent nuclear rods, eventually releasing them, effectively destroying our base. That's an interesting story. I'm still planning on a possible future investigation, but we'll see in the future. Another question, if you may. Now, the second battle of Hoover Dam may be something that could happen in the future, just between you and me, but what is the, the general idea of your plans for defense? The general plan is to fortify the dam with artillery and troops and establish a perimeter around it. We have a significant military presence in the area and will be ready to repel any attack. Then I will launch a completely unexpected attack which has no chances of failing by gathering my troops for a full-on assault towards the dam. I don't see what could go wrong. That doesn't seem like the most airtight plan. What if the Legion launches counterattacks? Also, what kind of attacks do you anticipate? While Legion counterattacks and flanks may be possible, our intel is excellent and completely flawless enough that we can determine they have no other tricks up their sleeves. We anticipate a frontal attack from the Legion. Their new attempt to take the dam will be in vain. That sounds like a serious threat. Do you think the NCR can handle it? Absolutely. We have the best trained troops in the wasteland, and we have the resources and firepower to defend the dam. We're confident that we can repel any attack and protect the citizens of the NCR. Well, I'm glad to hear that. It sounds like the NCR is in good hands, at least in your own words, with you as its military leader. I'm still kind of worried, though. You didn't hear it from me, though. General Oliver, I've heard about your rival, Legat Lanius, who leads the Legion's military forces. Can you tell us more about him and what makes him such a formidable opponent? Lanius is a brutal and ruthless warrior, feared by many in the wasteland. He's known for his military prowess and his ability to inspire his troops to fight to the death. He's a polar opposite of me, and we have very different views on how to lead and protect our people. What do you think are the strengths and weaknesses of his tactics? Lanius' strength lies in his ability to inspire his troops to fight fiercely, even in the face of overwhelming odds. He's also a master of strategy and tactics, able to anticipate his enemy's moves and outmaneuver them. However, his weakness is that he's often too focused on conquest and domination, and doesn't always consider the long-term consequences of his actions. At least that's what I think. That's interesting. Have you ever faced him in battle? No, I haven't yet. But I'm confident enough he isn't as tough and scary as he sounds. After all, I am the Chad and he is the Soyjack. I have faith in my troops and our strategy, and I believe we can defeat him if necessary. That's an interesting way to put it. Well, it sounds like you're ready for whatever comes your way. Uh, thanks again for joining us today, General Oliver. Thank you, Joe. It was a pleasure to be here. Are you tired of living in a world filled with chaos and danger? Do you long for a safe and secure future? Look no further than the Brotherhood of Steel. At the Brotherhood of Steel, we believe in the power of technology and the importance of preserving it for future generations. Our highly trained soldiers and knights are dedicated to keeping the wasteland safe from the dangers that threaten to destroy it, using the latest in military hardware and cutting-edge technology. But we're more than just a military organization. We're a family. We value loyalty, honor, and a commitment to the greater good, and we welcome anyone who shares those values to join our ranks, whether you're a skilled fighter, a talented engineer, or just someone who wants to make a difference. There, there's a place for you in the Brotherhood of Steel. So if you're ready to fight for a better future and protect the wasteland from those who would destroy it, come join the Brotherhood of Steel. Remember the Brotherhood of Steel for a safer tomorrow. And I know, I know, I probably shouldn't have accepted this sponsorship offer, but they paid up front and in caps. 15,000 caps to be specific. Sure, I could have just pocketed the money and burned their letter with this offer. But the Brotherhood of Steel is just so fucking cool. I'm not even fully talking about their power armor, which, don't get me wrong, is so dope. But even the way they carry themselves and act like they're knights of the round table, it's so sick. Everything about them is just so dope. And I know I'm going to catch some heat from Karen at the NCR's propaganda, I mean public relations office, for saying all of this. I just can't resist. The viewers and listeners watch and listen to my show because I say it like it is. No bullshit. Just pure unaltered opinion and some of you may not like what i have to say and that's fine hell some of you may even have had friends or family who served or maybe even died during the ncr and brotherhood of steel war but the brotherhood is undeniably cool everything from the 
power armor to their laser and plasma weaponry, the way that they treat themselves like knights of the round table, the technology that they amass, it's all very cool. And you know what? I've got a small batch of some special vault-grown wild wasteland kush on me right now that I'm going to spark up in honor of the Brotherhood of Steel. Cheers, everyone, and thank you to the Brotherhood of Steel for sponsoring the Joe Rogan Experience. And a quick message to NCR PR. When I'm on air, you don't get to blow up my Pip-Boy or Jamie's Pip-Boy with messages like, what are you doing? Stop this right now. And if you don't cut your broadcast, we'll shut you down. And my favorite of all of the messages you guys sent, we're sending an NCR tactical unit to shut down your podcast right now. You had your chance. Hope you enjoyed your 15 minutes of fame with the NCR. Like, I'd like to see you come down here and try to shut us down. This is the Joe Rogan Experience, the new California Republic's number one podcast. And we ain't going nowhere, motherfucker. So walk that tactical squad back to headquarters. Before me, Jamie, Mark Norman, Shane Gillis, and Ari Shafir start loading up our modified laser assault energy rifles. Me and the JRE crew don't play games. Karen. Welcome to the Joe Rogan Experience, folks. Today, I have a very special guest joining me, Marcus. Now, for those of you who don't know, Marcus is the mayor of Jacobstown, a town in the Mojave Wasteland. But here's the kicker. Marcus is also a super mutant. Yeah, you heard that right. A super mutant. Marcus, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. So, Marcus, can you tell us a bit about your backstory? How did you become a super mutant? It's an absolute pleasure to be on the show, Joe. Well, I used to be part of a vault, Vault 17 the same one that Lily Bowen, a nightkin, happens to be from. I was exposed to FEV, the forced evolutionary virus, and that's what turned me into a super mutant. Wow, that's intense. And what was it like being a super mutant? Yeah, it wasn't easy. A lot of humans were scared of us mutants, and rightfully so. I served with the Master for a long time. I eventually found my way to the town of Broken Hills, where I made a new life for myself. And I know you've had some experience with the Master. What was it like dealing with him? Yeah, the Master was a real piece of work. He was trying to create a new race of super mutants in an attempt to elevate humans to a new level. I respect the Master to this day with what he's done. That's wild. It sounds like you've had quite the journey. One thing that's always intrigued me about the super mutants is their ideology. I mean, you were created by a group that had some pretty extreme views. Did you ever agree with the Master and his vision for the future? At one point, I did believe in what the Master was preaching. I thought that creating a new race of super mutants could be the key to a better future for everyone. Over time, I've actually also come to respect the Vault Dweller who took him down. That's understandable. I can imagine it must have been tough to come to terms with those conflicting beliefs. So after the Master and his army were defeated, what did you do next? Well, I stuck around in the wasteland for a while longer trying to help out where I could. I eventually ended up settling in the town of Jacobstown, which was founded by a group of super mutants like myself. It's a place where mutants and humans can live together peacefully, and I'm proud to be the mayor of that town. That's really cool, Marcus. It's amazing how you've been able to make a positive impact on the wasteland despite all the challenges you've faced as a super mutant. Can you tell us a bit more about Jacobstown? What's life like there? Sure, Joe. Jacobstown is a small town nestled in the mountains of the Mojave Wasteland. We've got a mix of humans, super mutants, and other creatures living there, and we all get along pretty well. We've got a doctor who's working on finding a cure for the nightkin illness, and we're always looking for ways to improve our community. That's really impressive, Marcus. It sounds like you've built something truly special. And I have to say, it's great to see mutants and even some humans living together in harmony. We could all learn a thing or two from you guys. You mentioned earlier that you had some experience with the Vault Dweller. What was your relationship like with him, and how did he ultimately defeat the Master? Yeah, the Vault Dweller was an incredible person. Over time, I developed a respect for him as he fought against the Master and his army of mutants. As for how he defeated the Master, it was actually a pretty ingenious plan. He found the Master himself in the cathedral, and he destroyed it. Without the cathedral, and without Mariposa, which the dweller later destroyed, the super mutants lost their sense of purpose and scattered. That's really interesting. It sounds like the vault dweller was a true hero. And what did he do after defeating the master? 
I heard he went on to found a tribe in a place called Arroyo. Yeah, that's right. After defeating the Master, the Vault Dweller decided to travel northward and explore the rest of the wasteland. Eventually, he found a place called Arroyo, where he settled down and founded a tribe. He helped the people of Arroyo rebuild their community and taught them how to survive in the wasteland. It's a great example of how one person can make a difference. Absolutely. It's amazing to see how much impact one person can have on the world, especially in a place like the wasteland where life is so difficult. It sounds like you and the Vault Dweller have a lot in common in terms of your desire to make a positive impact on the world. As Speaking of Arroyo, I think our viewers are itching to know more about the Chosen One. Can you tell us a bit about how he came to be and what his role was in the wasteland? Sure thing, Joe. The Chosen One was actually the grandchild of the Vault Dweller, and he was born and raised in Arroyo. When the Vault Dweller passed away, the tribe entered a decline, and the Chosen One was tasked with finding a Garden of Eden creation kit, or GEC, which was supposed to contain the tools needed to rebuild the wasteland. Wow, that's pretty intense. So why did the Chosen One have to leave Arroyo to find the GEC, and how did you end up meeting him? The Chosen One had to leave Arroyo because the tribe was facing a drought, and they needed the Jek to create a sustainable source of water. As for how I met him, well, let's just say we crossed paths while he was on his quest. We had some common problems, so we teamed up to take them down together. That's really cool, Marcus. It's amazing how interconnected all these stories are, and it's fascinating to see how the actions of one person can have such a big impact on the world. You say that you crossed paths. How did you help the Vault Dweller, and what did he go on to do? Well, it seemed like he had a problem, and I had a problem. We were both trying to take down our problems. So we teamed up after he took care of my problem, and I helped him with his problem. Specifically, with what the Chosen One went on to accomplish, well, let's just say he saved the world. Wow, that's quite the accomplishment. How exactly did he save the world? The Enclave had this plan to release a virus called the FEV, which would have killed all non-mutated humans in the wasteland. The Chosen One was able to infiltrate their base and stop them from carrying out their plan. He also managed to destroy their oil rig, which was their main base of operations. Although I'm convinced that there were remnants somewhere, and they escaped so they're probably still alive. Yeah, that's what Nobark Noonan thinks. And so now you are here, in Jacobstown. It's amazing to see how all these stories are interconnected and how the actions of one person can have such a big impact on the world. Thanks for sharing your experiences with us today, Marcus. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks for having me, Joe. All right, folks, it's time for another quick break, and this time I want to talk to you about a company that's been a mainstay in the Mojave Wasteland for years. I'm talking about the Crimson Caravan, the premier trading company in the region. Now, you might be thinking, Joe, why are you talking about a caravan company? What's so special about that? Well, let me tell you, folks. The Crimson Caravan is more than just a group of traders. They're a network of skilled merchants who are dedicated to bringing goods and supplies to every corner of the Mojave. Whether you're a traveler in need of supplies, a settlement in need of provisions or a business owner looking to expand your inventory, the Crimson Caravan has you covered. They've got a huge selection of weapons, armor, food, and other essentials, all at competitive prices. And the best part is they're always looking for new business partners. So if you're a local vendor or a business owner looking to expand your market, the Crimson Caravan is the perfect partner for you. They'll help you get your goods to new customers, and they'll even offer you special discounts on their own products. So whether you're a customer or a business owner, the Crimson Caravan is the company you want to do business with in the Mojave Wasteland. Check out your local headquarters or stop by one of their trading posts today and tell them Joe Rogan sent you. Welcome back to the Joe Rogan Experience, folks. Today we've got a special guest with us, Nobark Noonan, a self-proclaimed scientist and conspiracy theorist from Novak. Nobark, how are you doing today? Well, Joe, I'm doing just fine, despite rad scorpion piercings. Thank you for having me on your show. You know, I've been following your podcast for a while now, and I've got to say, you're one of the few honest voices out there. Thanks. Man, I appreciate that. So, let's get into it. What kind of conspiracies are you into? 
Well, Joe, where do I start? There's so many things going on that people just don't know about. For instance, did you know that there are ghost commies at the Repcon facility? What? Are you serious? Dead serious, Joe. They want to fly to the moon, paint the moon pink, and draw a linen face on it. Not only that, you know that there's a secret government base on the moon? They've been up there for years, conducting all sorts of experiments and building all sorts of crazy stuff. And it's not just the moon. They've got secret bases all over the place. They're trying to fight the commies. That's insane. How do you know all of this? Well, Joe, I've been doing my research. I've got sources all over the place, people who have seen things that they weren't supposed to see. And let me tell you, once you start digging, you start finding all sorts of crazy stuff. I can only imagine. Uh, so what's the end game here? What are they trying to accomplish? It's all about control, Joe. They want to control the moon and spread their commie message. They'll stop at nothing to achieve their goals. They're using all sorts of advanced technology that we don't even know about yet. And they're manipulating us in ways that we can't even imagine. That's some heavy stuff, No Bark. It's definitely something to think about. Now, my other question is, there's rumors that cows have been dying left and right near Novak. You know anything about that? Oh, yeah, Joe. That's been going on for a while now. People around here have been losing their cattle, and nobody knows why. Some folks say it's the commies testing out some kind of new weapon, while others think it's some kind of alien activity. Alien activity? What makes you say that? Well, Joe, it's not just the cows. There have been strange lights in the sky, weird noises at night, and sightings of strange creatures around here. And let me tell you, it's not just happening in Novak. It's happening all over the world. Wow, that's crazy. So you think these aliens are targeting cows specifically? Well, Joe, there are a lot of theories about why the aliens might be interested in cows. Some say it's because of their DNA, while others think it's because cows are a major source of food for humans. But one thing's for sure, the aliens are up to something, and we need to be prepared. It's definitely something to keep an eye on. No, Bark. Let me ask you something. You think there might be some sort of practical explanation for the cow deaths, raiders, super mutants, or something like that? Well, Joe, it's possible, but I think there's more to it than just that. We've had raiders and super mutants around here for years, and they've never targeted cows like this before. And besides, the cattle are being killed in strange ways, with no visible signs of trauma or injury. That's definitely odd. So you're saying it's more likely that the commies or aliens are involved? Absolutely, Joe. It's just another piece of the puzzle. The commies and the aliens are always up to something, and we need to be vigilant if we want to protect ourselves and our communities. I hear you, man. It's definitely something to keep in mind. All right, let's move on. Before the show, you talked to me about the NCR conspiracy. What's that all about? Oh, yeah, Joe. The NCR is a shady organization that's been gaining power in the wasteland. They claim to be working towards a better future for all. But in reality, they're just trying to consolidate power and control everyone and everything. The, that sounds like a classic conspiracy theory. What evidence do you have to support this claim? Well, Joe, I've been doing some digging, and I found out that the NCR has been involved in some pretty sketchy dealings. They've been making backroom deals with the Enclave and other powerful factions. And they've been suppressing information that could be damaging to their image. Wow. So you're saying the Enclave is still alive and functioning? Interesting. So what's the end game here? What do they want? Like I said before, Joe, it's all about control. The NCR wants to be the top dog in the wasteland, and they'll stop at nothing to achieve that goal. They're using propaganda, censorship, and other dirty tactics to manipulate the people and keep themselves in power. That's definitely something to think about. Now, I want to hear more about your thoughts on the Brotherhood of Steel. What are they doing? Why have they been so quiet? Well, Joe, the Brotherhood of Steel is an enigmatic faction that's been operating in the wasteland for a long time now. They're known for their advanced technology and their strict code of ethics, but lately, they've been keeping to themselves and staying out of the public eye. That's definitely unusual. Why do you think that is? Well, Joe, there are a lot of theories out there. Some say that the Brotherhood is gearing up for a major conflict, and they don't want to reveal their plans too soon. Others think that they're involved in some kind of secret research or experimentation, and they don't want anyone else to know about it. Hmm, interesting. So what do you think the Brotherhood is up to? It's hard to say for sure, Joe, but one thing's for certain. They're not just sitting around twiddling their thumbs. The Brotherhood is always working towards some kind of goal, 
whether it's protecting the wasteland from dangerous technology or uncovering ancient secrets. Yeah, I've heard some pretty wild stories about the Brotherhood over the years. Do you think they're a force for good, or are they just uh, another power-hungry faction like the rest? Well, Joe, I think the Brotherhood is a complicated organization. They've done a lot of good in the past, but they've also made some questionable decisions. Ultimately, I think it's up to each individual to decide where they stand on the issue. That's a fair point. Now, House has been a previous guest on the show. I want to ask you, what's House's plan? What was he doing living this long? What's his plan for the Mojave Wasteland? Well, Joe, Mr. House is a complicated figure. He's been around for a long time, and he's definitely got some ambitious plans for the Wasteland. From what I've heard, House has been working on a project named Platinum Chip, which he hopes will become a hub of commerce and technology in the post-apocalyptic world. That's definitely interesting. But how does House plan on achieving this? Does he have the resources and manpower to pull something like this off? House is definitely a smart guy, Joe. He's got a lot of advanced technology at his disposal, and he's been using it to gain power and influence in the wasteland. So is House a force for good in the wasteland, or is he just another power-hungry dictator? That's a tough question to answer, Joe. On the one hand, House's plans could bring some much-needed stability and prosperity to the wasteland. But on the other hand, he's also a bit of a control freak, and he's not afraid to use violence and intimidation to get what he wants. Yeah, that's definitely something to think about. All right, folks, we're running out of time, but before we go, Nobark, I want to hear your thoughts on the future of the wasteland. What do you think it's going to look like in 10, 20, even 50 years? Well, Joe, I think the wasteland is always going to be a dangerous and unpredictable place. But I also think that there's a lot of potential for progress and growth. If the right people and factions can come together and work towards a common goal, we might just be able to create a better future for ourselves and future generations. Well said, no bark. All right, folks, that's all the time we have for today. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next time on the Joe Rogan Experience. Thanks for listening to my theories, Joe. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Joe Rogan Experience. Today, we have a very special guest joining us all the way from the Mojave Wasteland. His name is Benny, and he is a tribal chairman representing one of the four families that rule over the post-apocalyptic desert. Benny, I think one of the things that our listeners are really interested in hearing about is how Mr. House was able to subjugate the tribes in the Mojave Wasteland. Can you shed some light on that for us? Sure, Joe. It's actually a fascinating story. You see, Mr. House was a very intelligent man, and he had a vision for the future of the Mojave Wasteland. He understood that in order to achieve his goals, he needed to unite the various tribes under his banner. To do this, he used a combination of diplomacy and force. He negotiated with some of the more powerful tribes, offering them protection and resources in exchange for their loyalty. For those who refused to cooperate, he used his army of robots to crush their resistance and bring them under his control. Over time, Mr. House's influence grew stronger, and the tribes realized that it was in their best interest to align themselves with him. Eventually, he was able to consolidate his power and establish the New Vegas Strip as a thriving hub of commerce and technology. Wow, that's really interesting. So would you say that Mr. House was a benevolent ruler, or was he more of a dictator? It's a bit of a mixed bag, Joe. On the one hand, Mr. House was very effective at keeping the peace and maintaining order in the Mojave Wasteland. He also invested heavily in technology and infrastructure, which helped to improve the quality of life for many people in the region. However, he was also a very autocratic leader who brooked no dissent. He had a very clear vision of what he wanted to achieve and he was willing to do whatever it took to make that vision a reality. Some people saw him as a hero, while others saw him as a tyrant. That's a really nuanced perspective, Benny. It's clear that there are no easy answers when it comes to leadership in a post-apocalyptic world. Thanks for sharing your insights with us, Benny. I'm curious, on a day-to-day -day basis, what does your role as a tribal chairman involve? What are some of the responsibilities that come with that position? Well, Joe, my role as a tribal chairman involves a lot of different things. First and foremost, I'm responsible for representing my family and making sure that our interests are protected on the Strip. That often means dealing with the big man, as well as dealing with any threats that might arise. I also have to oversee the day-to-day -day affairs of my family, which can involve everything from managing our resources to resolving internal disputes. We have a strong sense of community within our tribe, 
and it's important to me to make sure that everyone is treated fairly and has a voice in the decision-making process. Finally, I'm responsible for preparing my family for any potential conflicts or disasters. The Mojave Wasteland is a dangerous place, and we never know when we might be called upon to defend ourselves. That sounds like a lot of responsibility, Benny. How do you balance all of those different roles and make sure that you're able to fulfill your duties effectively? It's definitely a challenge, Joe, but I have a lot of support from my family and advisors. We work together as a team to make sure that everyone's needs are being met and that we're all on the same page when it comes to our goals and priorities. It's also important to stay informed about what's happening in the wider world. I spend a lot of time talking to the other tribes, as well as keeping up with the latest news and developments. Well, it sounds like you're doing a great job, Benny. Thanks for sharing those thoughts. Before we wrap up, Benny, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on something. As you know, there are a lot of different factions vying for control of the Mojave Wasteland and the Hoover Dam. Who do you think is most likely to come out on top in this struggle, and why? Well, th well, Joe, it's hard to say for sure. There are a lot of different factors at play, and the balance of power can shift quickly in this part of the world. That being said, I think it's important to remember that the Mojave Wasteland is a place where strength and adaptability are highly valued. The factions that are able to maintain a strong military and economic presence, while also being flexible enough to respond to changing circumstances, are the ones that are most likely to succeed. Ultimately, I think the faction that is able to strike the right balance between these different priorities will be the one that comes out on top. Personally, either Vegas by itself or the NCR can serve this purpose. And hell, maybe even Caesar. It's a complex and unpredictable situation. Speaking of Vegas, I'd like to mention a little project I'm cooking up with Yes Man. What is this project? Who's Yes Man? Actually, forget it. No, come on, dude. I really want to know. I said forget it, Joe. I said nothing. Dude, leave me alone. Okay, fine. Sorry, I overstepped my boundaries. Thanks for sharing your insights, Benny. It's been a real pleasure having you on the show today, and I'm sure our listeners will appreciate your perspective on life in the Mojave Wasteland. Best of luck to you and your family in the days to come. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Joe Rogan Experience. Today, we have a very special guest with us. He's a ghoul mechanic and self-proclaimed gunslinger who says he's been imprisoned at Black Mountain in the Mojave Wasteland. Please welcome Raul Alfonso Tejada. Thank you for having me on the show, Joe. Raul, it's, it's great to have you here. So tell us a little bit about yourself. How did you become a ghoul and end up as a prisoner at Black Mountain? Well, Joe, I was born before the Great War in Mexico. I was a mechanic and an excellent shooter back then. When the bombs fell, I was with my sister at a ranch that was unaffected by the Great War. Her name was Rafaela. At some point, after we started accepting refugees, we started to run out of supplies. Eventually, when we started turning people away, things went to crap. One night, a group of people came and barred the house before setting our house on fire. Only me and my sister got out. Afterward, we headed to Mexico City against our better judgment. That's rough, man. How did you manage to survive for so long in the wasteland? Yeah, rough is one word. Well, Joe, I'm a survivor. I've been through a lot over the years. One day, after I was ghoulified, I found an old vaquero outfit and started wearing it. Rafaela really liked the outfit. I eventually gained a notorious reputation as a gunslinger, which led to people targeting me. Eventually, one morning after my sister went out, I found her dead. I destroyed the people who murdered her to the last man. I'm sorry to hear that, Raul. That's a terrible tragedy. It sounds like you've been through a lot of hardship in your life. So, how did you end up at Black Mountain? Well, after my sister's death, I continued wandering the wasteland. One day, I happened upon a radio signal from Black Mountain. When it went quiet, I got interested and decided to go up there. There, I met a mutant named Tabitha who, after I fixed the radio willingly, made work as a mechanic through means which aren't peaceful, to say the least. I tried to escape a few times, but I'm always threatened with violence. Damn mutants. That's, that's intense. How have you managed to survive working for the super mutants? It's not easy. I'm like a slave, and they don't give me much food or water. But I'm resourceful. I've managed to scavenge some parts and tools for myself over time. I also have a workbench which has allowed me to craft some devious plans over the years. Looks like they're too dumb to figure that out, 
That's impressive, Raul. Do you have any plans for your future? I've thought about some, Joe, but it's not easy to think with walls around me. The mutants have fortified the place pretty well, and they have some serious firepower. Plus, there's Tabitha. She's a tough cookie. Interesting to hear. For whatever reason a listener might be traveling along the I-15, I suggest you avoid Black Mountain. It's not a kind place. Now, at some point in your life, you must have passed through Arizona to get here. How's Arizona? Ah, Arizona. It's a tough place, Joe. The Legion has a strong presence there, and while many view the Legion negatively, in Arizona they've created a brutal but safe society. However, they're not too friendly to anyone else who doesn't fit their idea of the perfect society. One piece of advice I can give is to never sell chems to them. It won't end well for you. By the way, I listened to your podcast with Joshua Graham. Loved it. Oh, thanks, man. Anyways, in Arizona, there are some good people there, too, trying to make a living and survive in the wasteland. I've done some work for a few of them in the past. That sounds like a challenging environment to live in. What kind of work have you done for the people of Arizona? Mostly mechanical work, Joe. I've fixed up cars and weapons, and I've also helped some farmers repair their irrigation systems. I try to help out where I can. It's not easy being a ghoul in the wasteland, but I figure if I can do some good and make people's lives a little easier, it's worth it. That's a noble way of looking at things, Raul. It's clear that you've had to face a lot of adversity in your life, but you're still out there trying to help people. That's impressive. So what do you think the future holds for you? Do you have any plans or goals for the future? As I said, Joe, my main goal right now is to get out of Black Mountain and back into the world. Beyond that, I'm not sure. I've been thinking about maybe heading up to New Vegas and seeing if I can make a life there, find somebody. It's a dangerous place, but it's also full of opportunity. Maybe I'll even start my own garage and gun shop. Who knows? The wasteland is full of surprises. Now, I wanted to ask you about something that I've heard about in, in the wasteland, the Brotherhood of Steel. They're known for being pretty anti-ghoul, aren't they? Yeah, Joe, that's unfortunately true. The Brotherhood has always been pretty intolerant of ghouls, and they're not too fond of mutants in general. They see themselves as some holier-than-thou protectors of technology, and they think that anyone who's not human is a threat to that technology. I've had a few run-ins with them over the years, and it's never been pleasant. That's really unfortunate. It seems like they're missing out on um, the potential contributions that ghouls and other non-humans could make to society. Do you think something could be done to change their minds? Honestly, Joe, I'm not sure there's much that can be done. The Brotherhood is pretty set in their ways. They've got a pretty strict and stupid code, and they don't deviate from it. I think the best we can hope for is to try and find common ground with the people who are more open-minded. There are plenty of factions out there who are willing to work with ghouls and other mutants. And I think that's where we should focus our efforts. That's a good point. It's important to find allies and build a community of like-minded people who are willing to look past our differences and work together for the greater good. Now, speaking of communities, have you encountered other ghouls and tried to form partnerships? I can imagine that forming alliances with other ghouls might be a good way to help each other out. Absolutely, Joe. There are plenty of ghouls out there who are just trying to survive, just like me. Over the years, I've met a lot of them and formed some pretty tight bonds. We share resources, watch each other's backs, and offer each other support when we need it. It's not always easy to find people you can trust in the wasteland, but I've been lucky to find some great friends among the ghoul community. That's really great to hear, Raul. It's inspiring to see people coming together and supporting each other in such a harsh and unforgiving environment. It's a reminder that even in the worst of circumstances, we can still find hope and connection with others. Exactly, Joe. The wasteland might be a brutal place, but it's also a place where people can come together and make a difference. We might be mutants, but we're still human. And we still have the ability to build communities and support each other. Well said, Raul. Thank you again for joining us today. It's been a pleasure having you on the show. Thank you, Joe. It's been an honor.